Good morning, everybody. So good to see all of you who are worshiping with us live in the house, and so good to be seen by all of you who are worshiping with us from home and house to house as our house to house groups continue to get traction. Really, the point is that you're able to worship God together with the family of God or a portion of it and not neglect meeting together uh, as, as has become the habit and maybe the necessity uh, at times during this strange year. So, so grateful that Jesus' church, it prevails, right? If we could have seen ourselves a year ago, we would be totally disoriented as to what what's happening. But here we are, and Jesus' church is like that. It's a tough weed to kill. And he said, I will build my church. Hell won't prevail against it. And to see it continue to advance, to see the mission of the kingdom of God, the light in the darkness, the hope and the hopelessness continue to shine through you all. Man, so grateful for that. Um, you may have heard that there's an election coming up. And so over the next three weeks, in, in uh, anticipation of that time and leading up to that date, we're going to turn our attention in services to what it means to live our faith in the public square. What is our responsibility as Christians and our opportunity to represent Jesus in the national discourse? And I understand that many have um, found the highest virtue in church life to be, this is a politics-free zone, man. We just aren't going to talk about that in the name of unity. And listen, I'm all for unity. It's in the name, and it's going to continue to be. So we're going to continue to aim for unity in how we talk about this subject and, and, and endeavor respectfully to address the, the diversity of thought and the challenges and tension associated with it. We're not going to do it glibly. But look, if, if we say this is a politics-free zone, it's too touchy for us to talk about here, what are we really saying? Therefore, the place for you to talk about it, because make no mistake, we're going to talk about it, is, is what? It, like at the park, across from your house, around the water cooler at work, at the bar down the street? Whom are we leaving the national discourse to? The godless? Are we saying we're too afraid of, uh, of one another to talk about it here? So we're going to leave the self-governance to other than the people of God, I think never has our national discourse needed the wise, thoughtful, and loving contributions of the people of God than it does now. Would you agree? And so what we're going to talk about is not you should vote for this candidate because that's Jesus's candidate, but we're going to talk about how we as Christians engage public discourse and why it's important that we do and how we represent Jesus in the public square. So that begins next week, um, and uh, you could, that gives you a week to start preparing the, the, the emails you're going to send me before you even hear what I have to say. So if you want to just go ahead and send them now, I'll answer them all. I mean, I'll do my best to. Um, or you could listen to what I say and then respond to those words. Your choice, however you want to do it, right? That's fine. All right, let's jump into the Word. You ready? We're finishing out our series right now called Strange Land, where we're looking at how the founding fathers and mothers in Genesis lived the covenant of God intentionally, it would seem, as strangers in a strange land. So uh, are you ready? Are you ready to, to study the Word? Are you all ready to study the Word? I'm going to go ahead and take that as a yes, house to house people. I'm feeling the enthusiasm come through the camera. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thanks for the grace and truth that is Jesus our Lord. And thank you for the foundational value and strength of your word. We give it our attention now, and this is our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a pro prosperous, hopeful, and thriving community of... Americans of African descent in the Tulsa, Oklahoma suburb of Greenwood in the year 1921. Against all odds, as of course you can imagine, out of the horrors of American slavery, the emancipation era squarely landing in Jim Crow times, this was a time where prosperity, opportunity, advancement, and hope were in short supply in the lives of black Americans, but not in Greenwood. Have you heard this story? It's called Black Wall Street. Not only was there peace and opportunity, but there was prosperity, black-owned businesses, African-American families building homes, earning incomes that exceeded that of their parents. 
creating wealth through equity and business ownership, employing others, creating meaningful, large contributions to the gross national product. They were in Greenwood in 1921, living the American dream. And that would seem par for the course, but not for Americans of African descent. The American dream was far out of reach, that you would live a life better than your parents and grandparents. That was a pipe dream for black Americans. And yet here they were against all culture force and expectation. And do you know that among many in the white majority, sadly, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was intolerable. That was unacceptable. Perhaps it was fear. Perhaps it was jealousy or resentment or a sense misguidedly and twisted of who deserved what. But on one night in that year of 1921, many representatives of that discontented majority took it all from them and burned it all down. It's called the Greenwood Massacre in history, and it's been spoken of far too little. In an organized conspiracy that was perpetuated under the cover of darkness with the aid of government and law enforcement, members of the majority swept through the Tulsa suburb of Greenwood that year, and destroyed businesses, maimed and brutalized bodies, ended lives, bulldozed homes and whole neighborhoods, and all at once snuffed out that little pocket of hope. And I can imagine, sometimes I think about the, the survivors of the Greenwood Massacre, how horrific to the children that lived through that time that must have been. In their young life, they had known and hadn't known that other Americans didn't know such a thing and would have thought for decades to come that that was an impossibility, but they had known peace and prosperity and hope. And in one night, it was all taken. Their homes bulldozed, their parents' businesses destroyed, many of their parents' lives forfeit. And I can imagine after the pain, beyond the grief and trauma and loss, there was the maddening, appalling sense of injustice that lingered on and through the course of a lifetime made that such a formative experience. It was really as much as and more than perhaps the loss, it was the unfairness of it all that must have been the most difficult. And that's our title for this morning. To think that most Americans never heard of the Greenwood Massacre. We didn't learn it in American history. My wife attended college in the 1990s in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and spent four years there learning about the world and our country and never heard mention. It was swept under the carpet, a dirty little secret that we were proud of sinfully and then we were ashamed of. But the unfairness of it all, that's what must have lingered and still must exist. And that's the subject around which we're going to land the plane and wrap up our study through Genesis of what it means to be strangers in a strange land. We're in Genesis 37. The Bible reads, Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. And Pastor Daniel did such a good job last week addressing one of the very most complicated characters in all of Scripture, Jacob, and helping us find some more truth of what it means to live as foreigners 
in this land as God's people. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph, his son, was 17 years old, he tended his father's flocks. And remember, our premise for this series, from the beginning, God has asked his people to live like strangers in a strange land. Aliens and strangers, foreigners and outcasts, not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And so here in this place, we live like our citizenship is somewhere else. And we navigate with Jesus this strange land. He worked, Joseph, that is, for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. So already there's brokenness to this story, and you see the storm clouds forming. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. So his older half-brothers were his supervisors, but he was going around their back and t- telling on them. So you know that's not going to go well for very long. If you've ever had kids or been a kid, J- Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Well, you know, that's not going to go well either. And so we see second generation brokenness, right? We see the sins of the fathers visited on the sons and their sons. Because remember how Isaac favored, Jacob, or favored Esau and then his wife favored Jacob. And that family dynamic, that propensity toward the sin of favoritism passes down. Jacob does likewise and favors Joseph, and the other boys get resentful. Well, the plot thickens when one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, you know, the coat of many colors, that if you grew up in church, made it into the canon of Bible stories that you probably learned on a green flannel graph board, you know? So that's this. But his brothers hated Joseph, no surprise really, because their father had loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't even say a kind word to him. Now, for the sake of time, let me just fast forward and hit the highlights through Joseph's backstory. Remember, his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him, following God's directive, establishing this covenant. I will be your God, you be my people, I'll make you a great nation and bless the nations of the earth through you, and I'm going to give you this land. But for now... Go and be a foreigner, be a stranger, live like an outcast in that land. So Abraham did, Isaac followed suit. Jacob, for circumstantial reasons, leaves and wanders and is a foreigner in a different land. Now Joseph, you'd think, finally is going to be a homie, right? He's going to be like a a local. Doesn't last very long, though, because the brothers are resentful of him, and they do what any self-respecting brothers do when they get resentful of their little brother, and he gets a coat of many colors that they didn't get. They chucked him in a hole and planned to let him die. Um, But then they decided, no, let's not let him die. We don't want murder on our hands. Let's just uh, um, fake his death and sell him to slave traders. So they pulled him out of the hole and faked his death, bereaved his dad, and then sold him to slave traders. So here is a 17-year-old getting hauled away into captivity, literally leaving in a caravan of slaves. That's where we're going to pick up the story in Genesis 39. It says, Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders. So much for being the first local. Now he's a stranger in a different strange land, but it seems to be a consistent enough theme that God perhaps is in it. He was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer, who was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, And his crops and livestock flourish. So you think, all right, Joseph had a hard go at the beginning. Unfair to be sure. But he works his way up, climbs out of the hole, and now he's off to the races. Like, goodbye, dark clouds, uh, nothing but blue skies from now on. But not so fast. Verse 6, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. You'd think this would be to his advantage. But alas, Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. So somebody else's own brokenness thrusts itself into Joseph's story 
and hard times come again. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Remember, she got a credit in the opening uh, film noir for Strangeland, Potiphar's wife, seductress. So here she is doing her seductress worst. But Joseph refused, of course. Verse 11, one day, however, no one else was around, and he went to do his work, but she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. This was obviously a very enticing cloak. Maybe it's not the same cloak. But anyway, she grabs him. Joseph tore himself away, but he left a cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding the cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants, and soon all the men came running. Look! She said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here. So she went there to make fools of all of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. So complete lies, false accusations. And in verse 19, Potiphar was furious predictably, when he heard his wife's story and how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. And so Joseph's life continued. Can't win for losing. Just starts to get traction, and he's knocked back down. Starts to get traction again, and he's knocked back down a second time. The unfairness of it all the injustice as much as the loss had to have galled him. The fact that he did nothing but not slack on the job and because of his father's favoritism and his brother's jealousy, he ends up sold into slavery. How traumatizing for a teenager or any person. And then even so, God's blessing prevails. He's finally doing well again. And then somebody has him arrested on trumped up charges because he won't sin with her. So somebody else's brokenness injects itself into his story and now he finds himself in prison again. And I think after grieving the loss of his home and family, after grieving the loss of his position and status, I think the thing that might have endured in those long years in prison was the unfairness of it all. Can anyone relate to this? When you do everything right, or maybe not everything right, but you did most of it right, you didn't like cheat your way to the top, and things started going well until they didn't because you were treated unfairly, because injustice, perhaps, perhaps systemic and baked into our culture, perhaps a person who is put over you, who seems to have it out for you because they're jealous of you, perhaps circumstances that nobody could have seen coming, you just get the job and then your whole department is wiped out in a downsize because of a reception, recession, because of a pandemic. But you find yourself going, man, I can't win for losing. The unfairness of it all. Have you experienced that? Maybe you just start making friends and you, you kind of climb your way up and, uh, into where you're cool in school and then you move to a new place and nobody knows you and you got to start all over. The unfairness of it all after the loss and the pain, that sticks with you and it kind of gets into your soul, doesn't it? Well, here's what I think Joseph life, Joseph's life shows us about what it means to be strangers in a strange land. To live in this strange land is to endure injustice. It's part and parcel to the calling of God. To live as aliens and strangers is to endure injustice. It is going to happen. It is going to come. How I wish I could tell you that the Bible promises something different and how many preachers have because they don't want you to go away. They want you to think, give your life to Jesus, give your money to the church, and all your dreams will come true. All your problems will just disappear. But it's not that way. Jesus said, blessed are you when you endure injustice for my sake. In other words, get ready. To live as strangers in this strange land is to endure injustice. I suspect few peoples in history have understood the galling, appalling, enduring hardship of injustice like the Jewish people. For six millennia, they have been treated unjustly. Throughout the common era since Christ's birth, people's empire civilizations have mowed them down, bowled them over, kicked them out of their country, and tried to exterminate them from the face of the earth. One of the greatest 20th century thinkers and writers, a Holocaust survivor as a child, Viktor Frankl, in his 
toweringly significant work, Man's Search for Meaning, put it this way, beatings reflecting on the Holocaust, of which he as a child was a survivor, but uh, when he lost his parents. Can't imagine the horror and trauma. Beatings occurred constantly and on the slightest provocation, sometimes for no reason at all. And he said it was not the physical pain that hurt the most. It is the mental agony, listen, caused by the injustice, the sheer unreasonableness of it all. He goes on to describe how these guards, not just that they did beat you, but that they could at any moment for any reason. You didn't do what they wanted you not to do, so you got beat this day. You did do what they wanted you to do yesterday, so you got beat this day. He said there was so pervasively lacking in sense, in reason, that long after the bruises healed or you came to a sort of grim acceptance of slow starvation, your body kind of shut down and you almost didn't feel it. You became numb to the pain. But the injustice ate away at your mind. That's what he described in that book. And that's what unfairness does to us. Psalm 73 finds one of God's saints, the psalmist, reflecting on this theme and frankly feeling it himself and putting into poetry his experience. He said, I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. Anyone ever get to Psalm 73 and be like, thank you. Thank you for like making me feel like I'm not crazy. Thank you for putting in the Bible, the sacred writ, my sucky situation. Thank you for acknowledging the elephant in the room that like there are people who seem to do it all wrong and get away with it, and I try to do it all right, and I keep getting kicked in the shorts. Does anyone else find any, like, grim affirmation when you get to Psalm 73? They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. Verse 13, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Anyone ever feel that way? What was the point? Why did I read my Bible and pray every day? Why did I say no to all those opportunities to, to fit a square peg in a round hole? At least I would have had something good. Did I keep myself pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I got nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. That's the recompense for my troubles. Verse 16, so I tried to understand why this all goes down this way. But what a difficult task it is. And friends, I think what maybe is the crux of this matter is that as humans, validated by God's word, unfairness appalls us. And that doesn't mean we're immature, unformed, or weak Christians. Unfairness appalls us, and it's supposed to, because unfairness appalls God. Did you know you're made in the image of God? You are not mere mortals. Immortals is what you're sitting around with. People designed to live for eternity, made a little lower than the angels. People fashioned in God's form, hardwired with God's programming, infused with God's DNA. That's why we can say God isn't just our overlord. He is our good and loving father. He's not just your father in an ethereal kind of good, good father. Let me curl up in your lap when I'm having a bad day sense. He is your father in a very practical sense. Like you look like him. Very few people mistake Canaan for anyone else's son but mine. You've, you're wired like God. You have God fingerprints all over you. You have God DNA in the redemptive, regenerated you. And what that means is the part of you that gets just knotted up and can't get over injustice reflects a God who gets knotted up over and can't get past injustice too. Let me show you this. How big of a deal justice is to God? Did you know the word justice, referring to God, is used straightforwardly 135 times in Scripture and countless more uh, indirectly 
reference God's value for justice. Like all the Proverbs that talk about, you know, how dishonest scales and unequal measures are an abomination to God. An abomination, really? Like how much of a pound is a pound is an abomination? Yeah, injustice is what that's talking about. And it's saying God doesn't like it at all. Psalm 11 says the the righteous Lord loves justice. And in Psalm 9, it says he's known for it. It highlights his reputation. Psalm 36, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. And listen, your justice is like the ocean depths, of which we humans have only in the 21st century explored like 5%. Vast, unknowable. Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Your rule, metaphorically, is underpinned. Your approach, your leadership values begin with righteousness and justice. And the Lord gives righteousness, Psalm 103, and justice to all who are treated unfairly. Say all. I want you to hear it. Say all. Come on. All. You guys say all too. All who are treated unfairly, the Lord gives justice to you. You're like, well, what about people that live and die and never see their cause vindicated? Well, the Lord sees outside of time. We are eternal beings. And take this promise to the bank. Did you hear how our worship team challenged us to think of a promise that God has made? And then you sing that song, I am standing on every promise that you made. I believe they'll come to pass. I will see it in Jesus' name. Stand on this promise. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. And in Psalm 119, listen, how does that work? Your justice is eternal. Those girls in India whom Pastor Neil led us in prayer for, their whole lives have been abused. Can you imagine getting sold at seven by your parents for sex slavery? Are you kidding me? How worthless, how hopeless every minute of life would feel. The agony, the mental anguish, the distortion of your value. And yet God's justice is eternal. Those lives, if they linger on, are going to go 90 years. But eternity makes that look like a grain of sand, a speck of dust. And God's justice continues and continues and continues to play out. And so friends, Christian life isn't pretending that it doesn't matter. It's not like saying, hey, now that I'm a mature Christian, I'm going to act like the injustice that just tears me up inside, the mental anguish that it creates, it just doesn't matter. It's not saying, oh, don't worry about it. It's no big deal when someone wrongs us, calling it forgiveness and going away wishing that we were more religious so we could forget about it. Christian maturity is not forgetting about it. We are ambassadors of Christ. Christ is building the kingdom of God. He said, hey, here's the gospel. The kingdom of heaven, God's rule, God's justice, God's values. That happens up there. It's coming here. Jesus taught us to pray saying, let your kingdom come and your will be done here as it is there. There we've read it begins and ends with justice. And as Christ's ambassadors, we're like ambassadors to Sweden. We're not Swedish, we're American, but we live in a little outpost of Sweden called America. It's the embassy, and we advocate for America there. You are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. You live in a little outpost, a little slice of heaven here on earth, coming increasingly every day, praying that it will increasingly be here as it is there. And as ambassadors for Christ, for the kingdom of heaven, it only follows that what God values, you and I must value as well. So take this, if you hear nothing else I say in this series, that which twists you up in knots about injustice, that isn't something that you got to grow past or get over. That is the very heart of God in you. That's a good place to say amen. Now, the question is, what am I supposed to do about that? The great 20th century American author and armchair philosopher, William Faulkner, one of my favorites, in Intruder in the Dust wrote, some things, some things you must always be unable to bear. Some things you must never stop 
refusing to bear. Injustice and outrage and dishonor and shame, no matter how young you are or how old you have got, no, not for kudos and not for cash, your picture in the paper nor money in the bank either. Just refuse to bear them. What are those things for you? I would suggest when you hear that there are girls who are sold into slavery for sex by their parents and chewed up and spit out and left to die, that should never not appall you. And when you hear about Greenwood massacres and you realize you've gone 45 years of your life and never heard of it before, that should never not appall you because you are a bearer of the image of God. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. This is who we're made to be. So what do we do about it? Psalm 37, don't worry, God says, about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. It's as if God's answering the cry of the psalmist's heart from the previous passage. Don't get caught up in anxiety over it. Don't get jealous of those for whom it all seems to go right. Those who abuse you and seem to prosper for it. For like grass, they will soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they will soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. He will make your innocence, verse 6, radiate like the dawn. And the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Trusting the Lord and waiting patiently for him to act is not the same as saying, don't worry about it and letting it go. Those two things couldn't be more different. He's not saying if you're religious, if you're mature and godly, it won't bother you anymore. You'll be at such an enlightened plane that you almost won't notice injustice. You're human. You're made in the image of God. May you never not notice injustice in your own life and in the world around you. Trusting in God and waiting patiently for him to act is not saying don't worry about it and let it go. It's saying we have a choice. We have two options in how we respond to injustice. One is we take the law into our own hands and go vigilante justice. And the other is we wait for God's justice. We entrust ourselves to him. And when we wait for God's justice, we're not saying, if you can get around to it, God, we're saying the one who thought of justice, the one to whom it matters more than it matters to me, that which has been done unjustly by me, I'm going to put it in his hand. So when you entrust your case to God, you're not saying case dismissed, go home and figure out how to get over it. When you entrust your case to God, you're moving it up to the Supreme Court. First Peter 2 says it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it? This is commendable before God. To this, you are called. It's part of Christian living. Suffering unjustly and enduring. Because listen, Christ suffered for you and left you an example that you should follow in his steps. We represent Christ in this world. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He didn't say, you know what? Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. I forgive you. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. In other words, he was so aware of his father's insatiable thirst for justice that he went from the plaintiff to the defendant. He switched and was like, once he entrusted his case to his loving and just heavenly father who exacts justice eternally, 
all of a sudden thinking about what a great and terrible thing it is to fall into the hands of the Lord, of his tormentors, he said, oh God, don't do what you, don't do that thing you do. Don't punish them as their injustice deserves. Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. So close did Jesus walk with his father. So deeply did he understand his father's regard for justice. His father's regard for his son, for his daughter, for you and me. So in Romans 12, scripture says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What so often happens when we live long enough under the specter, the mental anguish of injustice is we let it consume us. We give in and respond with injustice in retaliation. As the ambassadors of Christ, as the people of God, foreigners, strangers in this strange land, we are called to overcome evil with good, to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, to entrust our own case, our own injustice to the hands of a loving Father and show the world what He looks like. That's what you and I are made to do. The hardest part about trusting God with that is, but is it going to get settled? Will I be taken care of? Yes, I can point people to Jesus, but what about me? What about my own soul's thirst for justice? Remember that God's word promises he will see justice done for his loved ones. Guaranteed. Amen. Will you stand with me? It's about time for us to go. We're going to pray together. And for those of you who are worshiping house to house, if you'd like, it's a good time after that to sign off, start your brunch, and have your discussion. We who are here in the house, we're just going to respond in worship. Ask the Holy Spirit to take what is God's word that is eternal and never returns void, that is powerful and alive, and sink it deep into our hearts. And then take what's my words and distraction and just let them fall to the ground. But can we respond together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have entrusted the words of eternal life to us, that we live as ambassadors of hope in a hopeless land and in a hopeless time. Thank you, Jesus, that you put us here in this strange land and armed us with the strength, faith, courage, and love of the Father, that you set an example that we go through nothing that you didn't go through before us. Help us like you when we are mistreated, in the face of the unfairness of it all, to entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. And we believe for that promise in our lives and in our land. In Jesus' name, amen.